Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Mora, and I'm a Bureau of Health Professions Fellow in Geriatric Psychiatry at UCLA. Today I'm here to talk to you about medications used in dementia and what caregivers should know. So as we go along, feel free to ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat, and we'll be able to answer your questions uh, at the end of the lecture. So to start off, thinking about this topic, I wanted to um, present this quote, which is, any symptom in an elderly patient should be considered a drug side effect until proven otherwise. And this is a very true um, statement that is important for physicians to keep in mind and for caregivers to keep in mind when we're taking care of our elders or our loved ones um, and they manifest new symptoms uh, or um, deterioration in terms of their symptoms and we're trying to figure out what might be causing it. So why caregivers? Why is this important for you to know? Um, maybe it's just the doctor who should be keeping track of these sorts of things. Well, medication-related problems, or MRPs, are more common due to the changes that occur with aging and disability. Um, older individuals are often not able to metabolize medications as well. Um, they may be more vulnerable to uh, side effects of medications um, due to fr kind of brains that may not uh, have as much cognitive reserve. Um, for example, individuals who may uh, have cognitive impairment or stroke. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that they are much more vulnerable uh, to medications than individuals in the younger population. So why caregivers? Well, caregivers spend the most time with these patients, and they are able to play a key role in identifying an actual or potential MRP or medication-related problem um, that the physician may not be picking up on. So why is this important? Well. If it's identified, um, it has the potential to prevent uh, unnecessary nursing home admission, hospital admission. Um, it has the potential to prevent falls and other adverse outcomes um, that may result from the medication-related uh, side effect or problem. Um, in studies that have been done, it's been found that caregiver knowledge of their loved one's medications is often greater than that of the care recipients themselves. So it's very important for caregivers to really play an active role in this way, and we'll also talk about tools that will allow you to do so. So what are some red, red flags to sort of think about, well, maybe a medication-related problem, or MRP, is going on here? Well, um, one, uh, a certain category involves sort of mental changes, and what we mean by that are symptoms like excessive drowsiness, confusion, depression, um, delirium, which is a clinical syndrome that's often caused by an underlying medical condition or by a medication that may not be uh, working well for that patient or causing these effects. Uh, delirium is a syndrome that we typically um, identify with four key symptoms, and those are inattention or difficulty to focus, um, difficulty focusing while having a conversation, sort of being distracted, um, a difficulty with alertness, so kind of falling asleep in the middle of a conversation, rapid onset, so very acute onset within days, um, hours to days, a patient can have this come on, and thought processes that are really disorganized. Some of you may be saying, well, how can I tell if um, my elder or the person I'm caring for has an underlying dementia. Individuals with dementia often will not manifest such a sudden change, and also they often will not have difficulty focusing um, or paying attention to what you're saying, even though they are cognitively impaired. Um, insomnia uh, is another um, medicate, potential red flag for a medication-related problem. So a patient who was uh, sleeping very well before, and all of a sudden um, they're up at night, they're not able to sleep, um, and they're really having difficulty in that regard. Changes in speech and memory. Um, I know this is challenging, especially with uh, you know elders who have advanced dementia, but 
it's very important to keep in mind sort of the time course. So is this a change in speech and memory that came about within a few days to weeks versus months to years, which we would normally expect in the course of the illness? So really the bottom line here is um, any of these red flags occurring over a shortened time course should, be, should raise a red flag for uh, looking at potential medication-related problems and looking back at, okay, was a medication increased recently? Was it taken off recently? Was it added recently? Other red flags include, in terms of physical uh, manifestations, Parkinson's-like symptoms. So new onset Parkinson's-like symptoms. And what I mean by this is shuffling gait, new onset tremor. Um, the patient is less verbal, less expressive. Um, their face is less expressive. Uh, they are having more falls, things like that. Um, incontinence, so new onset incontinence can also be a red flag for a medication-related problem. Muscle weakness, uh, so you know, if, the, um, if your elder is all of a sudden not able to sort of um, have the same strength that they used to, and again, on a shortened time course of days to weeks, it's important to really think about, could this be due to a medication side effect? Loss of appetite, um, we'll talk a little bit about this later, but this is a frequent issue with some of the medications we use to treat medication, excuse me, to treat uh, mood and cognition in individuals with dementia or dementing illnesses. Um, falls and fractures, so any new onset falls or fractures is an indication that um, perhaps a medication-related problem may be at play. So um, just to go through an overview of what we'll be talking about today, I wanted to cover briefly um, the different categories of medications that we use in individuals with dementia and cognitive impairment. So those involve medications for mood, and this may involve depression, um, as well as uh, irritability or um, a sort of a bipolar disorder or uh, kind of mood fluctuations in addition to treating apathy. Um, we're also going to be talking about memory medications um, for dementia, behavioral medications that are used to control difficult behaviors, including agitation, verbal um, aggression, physical aggression. Um, and then we'll also be talking about sleep medications. As many of you know, sleep can be a major issue in patients with dementia. So it's important to also be aware of the side effects associated with the common medications that we use for sleep. So starting off, I'd like to discuss medications used for mood. Um, so there's a lot of information, um, and I'm going to try to go through it as uh, you know, slowly as possible so people kind of understand what's going on. But feel free to send any questions our way. Um, so in terms of the common medications that we use to treat mood symptoms, and this is typically depression um, in dementia, we will often use the antidepressants. Um, and this involves several classes, one being the SSRIs. Um, up here, uh, examples of SSRIs are sertraline or Zoloft, citalopram or Celexa, escitalopram or Lexapro, fluoxetine or Prozac, paroxetine or Paxil. Um, and then we also have SNRIs, so more noradrenergic in addition to serotonergic activity, uh, which involve duloxetine um, or Cymbalta, venlafaxine or Effexor, and mirtazapine or Remeron. Well, Butrin or Bupropion is a medication that is not considered an SSRI or SNRI. It has a more dopamine-related um, method of action. So in terms of how we uh, think about these medications, the SSRIs are typically our first line that we'll use to treat patients with dementia and, uh, who also manifest um, depressive symptoms. Now. Um, the main thing to keep in mind with the SSRIs is that they can cause um, GI side effects like uh, loss of appetite, nausea, um, kind of uh, diarrhea issues like that in the first couple days to weeks, although this can go on. Um, and if 
our elder is having that problem, it would be important to readdress whether this medication is the right medication for them. Um, any of the SSRIs can also contribute to sedation, confusion, falls, um, things like that. The more serious um, effects of SSRIs can involve something called serotonin syndrome, which typically, typically occurs when you're combining multiple SSRIs or multiple antidepressants together. Um, this is a very uh, dangerous um, condition that is characterized by confusion or altered mental status, um, high blood pressure and high heart rate, um, high fever, as well as uh, tremors or jerking movements of the extremities. So it's very important to be aware of this um, potential uh, adverse effect when thinking about um, an individual who is on maybe one or more uh, SSRIs. Um, in general, we try not to use Prozac, Paxil, or Wellbutrin in older adults, um, mainly for uh, several different reasons. Prozac tends to have a very long half-life. It stays around much longer than any of the other SSRIs, and that can really build up um, in the body of the patient, especially uh, if they're having bad effects from it, it's hard to stop the medication and have those uh, effects go away right away. So we tend to avoid that. Um, it can also um, lead to increased anxiety uh, for some patients. Paxil uh, tends to have what we call more anticholinergic effects, and we can get into that a little bit later. Um, but uh, essentially, dementia is a condition where there's a lack of acetylcholine in the brain. And so any medication that is anticholinergic is only contributing to the problem, reducing the level of acetylcholine and impairing cognition. So even individuals who do not have dementia, who suffer from depression, who maybe started on a medication like Paxil with strong anticholinergic effects, can have cognitive dulling from it um, and confusion that can occur. Um, other anticholinergic effects can include urinary retention, so difficulties with passing urine, um, as well as dry mouth and constipation, which in patients with dementia, they're already struggling with many of those issues. So we try not to start um, that medication to, to potentially make those, those issues worse. Um, well, Butrin tends to be a much more activating medication. It's not so great for anxiety, which we often find is comorbid with depression in patients with dementia. So we tend to avoid it um, in general. Additionally, while Butrin can increase um, seizure risk, uh, which um, in many patients with dementia, particularly advanced dementia, is something that we're uh, concerned about already. So we try to avoid that. Um, so in terms of uh, other things to watch out for with antidepressants, um, sort of more rare uh, things that may occur, is that in individuals with dementia and depression who may have an underlying bipolar disorder that has not been diagnosed, starting any of these medications um, in one of those patients can potentiate or cause a switch into a more manic or hypomanic state. And this may be characterized by irritability, um, mood swings, insomnia, uh, things like that. Um, it's important to keep in mind that individuals with underlying bipolar disorder um, may spend, uh, do spend approximately 75% of the time depressed. So someone who may have sort of gone under the radar for some time, particularly if they had um, uh, the less severe form of bipolar disorder, bipolar disorder called bipolar II, uh, this is something to keep in mind. Um, so second line medications uh, for depression in patients with dementia involve tricyclic antidepressants. Um, these, may, these are uh, examples of this include um, amitriptyline, nortriptyline. Um, these are frequently used in patients who have comorbid migraines um, or who may be having neuropathic pain. However, they are considered um, dirtier drugs in the sense that they um, are less specific uh, in terms of the receptors that they target and can have more anticholinergic side effects, uh, for example, 
um, which we talked a little bit about before, as well as higher risk for cardiac arrhythmias um, based on their effects on the heart. And so that's something important to keep in mind. Um, a less used class of medications that's often used in treatment refractory depression include the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, this involves uh, medications like um, tranalcipramine. Uh, we very rarely use uh, these medications in patients with dementia. Um, there, uh, there's a lot of reasons why, but they also have high risk of um, serotonin syndrome um, as well as um, hypertensive crisis. Uh, when combined with certain foods. So there's a lot of dietary restrictions that go into that. And so uh, we tend to avoid that class um, in this population. Also, antipsychotic medications or neuroleptics, which we'll talk about in a little bit, are often used for augmentation of treatment of depression um, in, patients, uh, in patients with and without dementia. So that's something important to keep in mind. Um, I should, also, I should also mention uh, that any of the SSRIs that we spoke about or SNRIs also have an um, uh, effect of um, increasing bleeding times. Um, this has uh, not necessarily been borne out uh, for individuals who are not already at risk for gastrointestinal bleed, but for individuals who are at risk for bleed, bleeding or have already had a gastrointestinal bleed. Um, this is important to keep in mind in terms of uh, potential effects uh, caused by medication. Okay. Um, I should also mention with uh, Welbutrin and any of the SNRIs like duloxetine and venlafaxine and mirtazapine, um, there is a risk for increased blood pressure uh, for patients who um, may already um, you know, struggle with that as a problem. Okay, so I'd like to move on to talk about memory medications. Um, so these are medications that we use to um, not to cure uh, the dementia or to um, improve necessarily uh, the cognition, um, but these medications have been shown to slow the decline, um, the inevitable decline that occurs um, when patients uh, have dementia. Um, so. The common ones that we use are Dinepazil or Aricept, Galantamine or Razadine, Rivastigmine or the Exelon patch um, or oral form. Um, these are all considered acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And essentially, going back to the idea that um, uh, dementia, uh, particularly Alzheimer's dementia, can be a state of um, deficient acetylcholine, essentially the, mechani the mechanism of action of these drugs is that they um, stop the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, thus increasing the level of acetylcholine um, in the brain and uh, with the presum presumed idea that it improves um, cognition or at least prevents further decline. Um, so in terms of important uh, medication-related problems that can come from acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, the main thing to consider is that all of these medications do have adverse effects in terms of loss of appetite, nausea, or GI symptoms like diarrhea. Um, so patients can feel when they're started on these medications as though they've lost their appetite, they may begin losing weight. Um, for patients who may be more nonverbal, uh, this may manifest as um, you know, simply more irritability, uh, refusing meals, um, and uh, sort of mood changes. So it's important to really be aware of the timing of these medications and when they're started, and to be monitoring um, your loved one or elder's um, sort of eating habits and schedule uh, following initiation of these medications. Oftentimes, um, riv rivastigmine is actually um, one of the, the worst offenders uh, when it comes to um, the GI side effects, uh, which is part of the reason that the patch can also be helpful. The patch does not have um, the risk of GI side effects the same way the other oral forms do. Um, so moving on, I wanted to um, also talk about, oh, excuse me, actually I just want to go back for a second. The second major thing to look out for with acetylcholinesterase inhibitors is that they can actually lower the pulse 
So um, what this means is that for individuals who may already have a low heart rate, uh, the medication may lower their heart rate further, putting them at risk of passing out or falling um, from decreased uh, blood flow to the brain. Oh, excuse me. I think I did something. Sorry about that. OK. We're back up. Um, due to decreased blood flow to the brain. So um, it's important uh, to monitor also your loved one for any symptoms of dizziness or falling that occur after uh, starting these medications, and to monitor the heart rate. Typically, if somebody's heart rate is in the 50s, um, 50 beats per minute, uh, we will usually um, not start one of these medications um, until the heart rate uh, reaches a more kind of regular level above uh, 60 beats per minute due to this risk. So the next medication I wanted to talk about is Mimantine, or Nemenda. Um, this is a medication that has a completely different method of action uh, from the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Um, it is an NMDA antagonist. Um, so it essentially um, works on a different neurotransmitter called glutamate in the brain um, and works with the hypothesis that uh, dementia is a state of um, excitotoxicity or overstimulation from an excitatory neurotransmitter like glutamate. So essentially, memantine will lower, um, will work against uh, that issue, essentially lowering glutamate uh, toxic level, to lowering glutamate levels and hopefully improving um, that, uh, that potential toxicity. So um, essentially, the important thing to keep in mind with uh, memantine is that it can also cause um, some mood symptoms. Um, it can cause fatigue. Um, it can also, in patients who have kidney issues, um, it's metabolized through uh, the kidney or the renal system. So any impairment of the kidney can also lead to very high levels of nemenda or memantine, um, and that can uh, cause confusion um, and delirium, as we talked about before. Um, and um, it also can uh, increase the risk of seizures um, when, it can get to, when it gets toxic. But this is very rare. Um, so I'd like to move on to medications used for behavioral symptoms. Um, I should probably uh, mention that um, it's very important when a patient has behavioral symptoms to really understand where that change in behavior is coming from. So for example, untreated pain can manifest as behavioral symptoms. Um, also, there's a full range of behavioral symptoms. So wandering, uh, verbal, um, you know, just speaking verbally uh, constantly or verbal aggression. Um, and then on the other range, physical aggression, which actually threatens the safety of caregivers. So before starting any medications, we will often try to manage um, behavioral symptoms with non-pharmacologic interventions. However, when safety becomes an issue and caregivers um, are at risk, we will uh, often need to use uh, medications to try to control the behavior. Um, oftentimes when the behavior is not um, physically threatening or threatening safety, um, but medication is desired, um, some of the antidepressants that we spoke about, as well as the cognitive um, medications that we spoke about, can sometimes have an improved effect on behavioral issues, um, on the more mild behavioral issues. Um, however, when it comes to physical aggression, we, we obviously take that very seriously and we think about um, other medications that can effectively essentially control um, that behavior a little bit better. So um, one of the classes that we frequently use are the antipsychotic uh, medications or dopamine antagonist uh, medications. Um, these involve medications such as quetiapine or Seroquel, olanzapine or Zyprexa, Risperidone or Risperdal, Aripiprazole or Abilify, and Ziprazidone or Geodon. Um, there's a couple other ones that are on the market, but these are um, the most commonly used ones at this point in time. 
Um, so what are the most important side effects to look out for when using a uh, antipsychotic medication? Um, well, the antipsychotic medications range um, in terms of their potency. So you have very low potency uh, antipsychotics as well as very high potency antipsychotics. And depending on whether something, and potency relates to um, the way in which the medication binds to the receptor, so how quickly and, um, and how tightly it binds to the, the uh, dopamine receptor, which is what it acts on. Now, uh, medications that are low potency, so that involves a medication, for example, like Seroquel, uh, they tend to have more effects involving sedation um, or over sedation, um, effects involving uh, low blood pressure when going from a sitting to a standing position, uh, which we call orthostatic hypotension. So this may manifest as um, the patient uh, saying that when they get out of bed in the morning, they feel dizzy. Their head is kind of spinning, and they sort of have to catch themselves. Um, or when they go from a sitting to standing position, um, feeling as though the room is spinning, or they feel a little bit lightheaded. So, um, and this, you know, at its very worst, can lead to falls or passing out, which is very important um, to be mindful of, especially if one of these medications were started recently. Um, essentially, uh, higher potency medications, um, one of those, uh, I guess, risperidone on this list would be an example of that. Um, they tend to have more effects along the lines of um, potentially creating uh, Parkinson's-like symptoms, so um, reductions in the ability to walk normally, so shuff more of a shuffling gait, a tremor, um, involuntary movements uh, of the face or mouth, um, as well as stiffness uh, and rigidity um, in the muscles and uh, in the muscles of the usually the um, upper extremity, but can occur um, anywhere else as well. Um, the higher potency agents um, can also call, cause sedation, um, higher risk for falls as well. Um, uh, in terms of the overall class of antipsychotics, um, important things to keep in mind um, involve the fact that uh, currently there is a black box warning on all of these medications um, indicating that in studies it's been found um, that they all increase the risk of stroke or um, cardiac uh, mortality. Um, now, uh, this definitely was done in a much um, more ill population, a much older and much more ill population. However, it's an important um, issue to keep in mind when thinking about the risks and benefits of starting one of these medications. Um, other uh, important considerations for the entire class of antipsychotics involve the fact that um, especially the second generation or atypical antipsychotics, which we are, are sort of our default um, in this population, um, which are all listed here, uh, there is the risk of um, uh, increased risk, essentially, of um, glucose, uh, or excuse me, insulin resistance um, and developing uh, metabolic side effects, so weight gain, um, hyperlipidemia, so high cholesterol, um, so this is uh, very important for elders who may suffer already from uh, metabolic syndrome or diabetes, um, and these medications may actually cause a worsening of some of those issues, so blood sugars that are much higher, and this can manifest in multiple um, issues further down the line, so, you know, um, mood changes that come from the sugar fluctuations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so other uh, medications that we um, don't use, don't uncommonly use in patients for whom the behavioral issues have really gotten to the point where there is physical um, aggression and safety uh, may be an issue, um, or uh, you know, mood is really um, kind of extremely irritable and leading to lashing out uh, episodes. Um, we will often use a medication called valproate or valproic acid also known as Depakote. Um, this is a medication that um, is an anticonvulsant, so it's used um, typically in high doses for uh, seizure disorders. However, um, in lower doses, it can be very helpful uh, with individuals um, who suffer from dementia who may be having a lot of these behavioral problems. 
important things to keep in mind in terms of um, uh, side effects or adverse effects from Depakote involve um, rash, uh, bleeding risk, um, dizziness or confusion that can occur when levels go above or become toxic, for example. Um, so for this reason, blood levels of this uh, medication are frequently monitored um, to make sure that they are not uh, reaching toxicity. And actually, with older adults, we'll tend to keep, um, keep them sort of at the lower range, whatever is working for the behavior. We follow the behavior, not the drug level. Um, it's important to also uh, know that um, uh, essentially sedation can be part of what can happen with this medication, as well as changes in liver enzymes, um, which uh, you know the physician will frequently be monitoring while on this medication. Um, but uh, in rare cases, um, it can affect um, liver function, and that in itself can cause confusion and other issues um, somewhere down the line. So it's just important to really keep in mind if your older adult is um, experiencing new onset confusion and Depakote has been something that's been started to really bring that to the attention of the physician sooner rather than later. Um, so I'd like to move on to a group of medications that are frequently used um, in patients with uh, dementia, um, usually by non-geriatric psychiatrists. So, um, these are benzodiazepines. These involve medications like lorazepam or Ativan, alprazolam or Xanax, clonazepam or clonopin. Um, ask any geriatric psychiatrist and they will tell you we avoid these medications in our older adult patients, particularly our patients with dementia, at all costs. Clearly, there are some times that you do need to make an exception, but in general, for behavioral issues, these are not um, the first line medications that we will go to. Um, the main reason is that uh, benzodiazepine medications um, are associated with increased risks of falls in this population, increased confusion, um, and essentially uh, increased mortality overall. So it's, um, it's very um, seductive very, very often to just use one of these medications because they really calm the patient right down. Um, you know, they may actually sedate them um, and they seem less anxious. But these medications can also stick around in the body for quite some time. Um, and in older adults who may not be able to necessarily metabolize the medication as well, um, it can build into levels that cause delirium, confusion, falls, um, and uh, essentially adverse outcomes. So we really uh, try to avoid um, that group of medications. Um, so I'd like to move on to sleep medications. Um, this is a very common complaint in patients with dementia. Um, they're not sleeping well. Um, they're wandering at night. Um, they go to bed very, very early, and then they're up you know, early in the morning. Um, I would like to reiterate that essentially the first line treatment for sleep problems in patients with dementia is non-pharmacologic. So really looking at, you know, um, are they, is the reason that they're up at night is because they're sleeping during the day, um, they need a little bit more activity or more structure, um, are they having dysregulation of their um, sleep cycle, in which case would it make sense to expose them to sunlight late in the afternoon? So um, their uh, melatonin is suppressed and they are not as sleepy earlier in the night and thus not waking up early in the morning. So they're kind of going to bed a little bit later and able to sleep through the night. Um, so it's important to really identify and understand when an older adult is having, with a dementia is having sleep disturbance, um, what is that coming from? But you know, a lot of times we'll sort of try to address things non-pharmacologically, and if that doesn't work, it's very important to consider um, whether medications can be helpful. So commonly used medications um, for sleep in individuals with dementia um, do involve a couple different classes of medications. Um, one being the antipsychotic medications, which we talked about earlier, um, which do carry uh, all of their side effects, uh, you know, and adverse effects that we talked about. Um, 
usually if the problem is only sleep and there is no comorbid depression, no behavioral symptoms, um, no um, anxiety, then we typically try to stay away from the antipsychotics. So um, we will often use the antipsychotics for sleep when there's another issue that the antipsychotic is potentially treating. But um, in general, it's not the first line that we will go to for sleep. Um, oftentimes, we will use anti, uh, sedating antidepressants um, for sleep issues in individuals um, with uh, dementia. Um, a very common one is trazodone or Deseril. Um, this is a medication that came out um, kind of uh, you know, over 10 years ago um, in the 1990s as an antidepressant, but was so sedating um, that really was found to be better as a sleep medication. Um, side effects from trazodone do include over sedation, confusion, falls, as any of these sleep medications can. Um, but it tends to be less of an offender than, for example, the benzodiazepine class or a couple other classes we'll talk about later. Mirtazapine or Remeron is a frequently used medication for sleep in individuals with dementia who often have comorbid depression. Um, so, you know, it can often sort of be helpful for those two issues and minimizes needing to use two separate medications for those issues. Um, however, it does have the risk of orthostatic hypotension or low blood pressure when going from a sitting to standing position, thus increasing falls. It can affect blood pressure, so that's important to be monitored. Um, and in that sense, it can also, like any of these medications, um, cause confusion if too high of a dose, for example, or if the patient is just very sensitive. Um, I should also mention that uh, Remeron does have the effect of increasing appetite, which often uh, is helpful in individuals with dementia who may be frail or losing weight. Um, however, for patients for whom uh, diabetes or obesity is a problem, that is something that is important to keep in mind. So um, medications for sleep um, that tend to be less safe uh, involve actually um, the most accessible one. So over-the-counter uh, Benadryl um, is actually one of the most dangerous medications for individuals with dementia. Um, and older adults in general um, because of its anticholinergic effects, which we talked about before. So um, diphenhydramine or ben Benadryl, has, it's, an, it's a potent antihistamine, but it also has significant anticholinergic effects, which can lead to increased confusion, increased sedation, increased risk for falls, um, and increased delirium. So we really try to stay away from that, and we try to educate uh, caregivers about that. Um, again, uh, benzodiazepines are frequently used, frequently um, prescribed in the primary care setting for sleep. However, in this population can be very unsafe and can really lead to increased risk of falls, confusion, um, et cetera. Um, some people have asked, well, what about uh, Ambien or Zolpidem, um, kind of the benzodiazepine-like sedative hypnotics? So these are medications that are used for sleep. They are related to um, benzodiazepines and have a similar method of action. However, they do not have as much of a potential, for example, for abuse um, or tolerance necessarily. Um, so you know, they're frequently used as sort of a safer alternative. Now, unfortunately, in our population, so individuals with dementia, cognitive impairment, older adults who may be more frail, um, these medications can actually be fairly um, dangerous in terms of also increasing risk for confusion, increasing risk for falls. Um, we tend to stay away from them um, as the first line treatment for um, individuals uh, with dementia who are having sleep disturbances. Okay. So um, I'm going to briefly talk a, a little bit about um, herbal remedies or vitamins that are frequently um, you know, uh, used uh, in individuals with dementia 
Um, oftentimes, caregivers uh, do bring in um, their elders or loved ones, and they mention, well, you know, we started this. Um, and for the most part, you know, for example, coconut oil has been very hot right now. Um, for the most part, uh, interventions like that, despite um, not having a, a lot of evidence behind them, are not necessarily uh, harmful. However, uh, there are certain ones that do have significant um, adverse effects or could potentially cause medication-related problems that I feel is important to really um, discuss briefly. So in terms of alternative medication or herbal um, medications um, for mood or depression, uh, two of the most frequently uh, used ones are St. John's wort and S-adenosyl methionine, or SAMe, um, often available in uh, health food stores. However, um, it's very important, both of these have been found to have efficacy in treatment of depression, not necessarily treatment of depression in dementia, um, but they do have efficacy in um, sort of younger age groups that don't have that comorbidity. Um, however, there are very important considerations uh, with both of these agents. So um, I'm going to just start with St. John's wort, which um, despite its efficacy for depression, does have significant liver interaction. And what this means is that it can interfere with the metabolism of a multitude of medications um, that our older adults, specifically our older adults with dementia, may already be on. So either decreasing levels or increasing levels based on the way it inhibits the liver uh, enzymes that are in charge of metabolizing um, or getting rid of other medications. So, um, so some of those uh, interactions involve um, medications like um, essentially digoxin, so it can lower levels of digoxin. Um, it can also um, essentially decrease the level of warfarin, warfarin which people take um, for clotting disorders, uh, so putting them at risk for you know, developing another clot. Um, it can decrease levels of HIV medications, um, which is you know, the protease inhibitors, which can be very significant. Um, this uh, medication, as well as S-adenosyl methionine, um, they both work serotonergically. So that means that they're working on serotonin. So for example, um, if a patient is also on another serotonergic medication, like an antidepressant, and the physician is not aware that they are taking one of these supplements, it can increase their risk for serotonin syndrome, which we talked about earlier, which is a medical emergency. Um, so in terms of um, memory medications that are herbal, that are frequently used, um, two of the most uh, recent ones um, sort of talked about have been ginkgo biloba, vitamin E. Um, unfortunately, as of a 2009 study, ginkgo biloba has not been found to be um, a significant in terms of um, essentially slowing the course of uh, cognitive decline in dementia. Um, however, uh, many individuals continue to use it. It's important because this medication can interact um, with other medications, um, including uh, essentially um, increasing risk of bleeding when combined with warfarin, heparin, or NSAIDs, like non-steroidal -steroid anti-inflammatory uh, medications like um, aspirin, or excuse me, um, Aleve, um, aspirin, um, Motrin, any of those medications. So it's important to exercise caution there. Um, so in terms of uh, side effects um, from ginkgo biloba, uh, other than that, there isn't, um, there isn't that much. Uh, vitamin E has recently been found to be promising in slowing the decline of um, cognition in individuals with dementia. Um, however, it does carry the risk of GI side effects, uh, which may manifest as um, losing weight or lower appetite. Um, patients can have uh, more fatigue uh, with uh, vitamin E. Even though it is a vitamin, you would think, well, you know, how harmful could it be? It definitely has effects, especially when it gets to very high levels. So uh, lastly, I'd like to talk about um, sort of alternative remedies for sleep. Um, we actually do use melatonin um, quite a bit in this population 
particularly when it's found that the sleep issue is really kind of a reversal of sleep cycles. Um, and melatonin can be helpful in doses from three to six milligrams. However, um, you know, no uh, supplement or medication is without um, its side effects, and one of the main things with melatonin is essentially sedation, over sedation, uh, which can lead to um, falls, et cetera. Um, and uh, pa some patients actually will experience sort of a paradoxical insomnia um, on melatonin, so it's important to keep an eye out for that. Okay. So I wanted to just briefly go over other considerations when it comes to medications being used in this population. Um, and one of those considerations is the idea of polypharmacy. So polypharmacy is essentially defined as the use of multiple medications, and more recently it's been defined as the use of five or more medications um, that essentially can have potential interactions with each other. Um, so it's important, uh, many of our patients in this uh, population, so patients with dementia, will be on more than five medications. And um, it's important to work with the physician to make sure that uh, all of these medications are actually indicated and needed. And that includes vitamins and herbal, herbal remedies as well. Um, so polypharmacy, um, when a patient is on more than five medications, multiple different medications, um, has been associated with increased frailty, so um, losing weight, um, weakness, uh, exhaustion, um, sort of when doing very small things or small activities, um, more increased mortality, increased disability, and, and increased falls. And so, you know, how much does it increase the fall risk? Well, um, it's been found that if the patient is on five to nine medications, um, it increases the risk of fall by four times uh, the amount. Um, if they're on more than 10 medications, it actually increases their risk six times. So risk of falling is increased by six times, a factor of six. So it's really important to really, in this population, less is more. Um, really seeing about uh, whether um, really reassessing medications, is it really important uh, for this person to be on all these medications, or are there ways of simplifying this medication regimen so that we can decrease uh, polypharmacy. So other considerations in this regard is that teamwork is crucial. Um, it's important for the caregiver, the pharmacist, the physician, the psychiatrist, if they're involved, um, to really work together and function as a team to avoid these medication-related problems. The caregiver is the eyes and the ears of the physician and the pharmacist. Um, if you are not uh, you know, seeing it, essentially, it's very unusual for the physician to notice or to be able to, to become aware of some of these things. So, um, so it's important uh, because it contributes to better outcomes for these patients and improved daily functioning. Um, so what can you do as a caregiver? You know, um, you're probably saying, well, you know, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to uh, do this? And I don't want to put all the burden on you, but um, there are certain tools that can be helpful um, to being able to play an active role in, identifi in identifying medication-related problems and essentially nipping them in the bud. So um, practical tips. Uh, here are a couple um, important questions that um, providers, uh, you know, it's important to ask the provider. Um, and we're open to this because a lot of times, you know, um, especially specialists, they're maybe, they're maybe not looking at the entire picture or the, um, you know, the appointment is rushed. And so having the caregiver as an active participant is very important uh, for us to really collect all the information to make a decision that's going to be a healthy one for the patient. So questions like, is this medication really needed? Um, is this medication the most appropriate for the medical condition being treated? Will the medication be a problem with other medical conditions that are occurring at the same time? Is the medication being prescribed at the right dose? Does the medication interact with other medications? So um, finding ways of getting this information from the physician 
during the visit can really um, help you be aware of you know, what this medication can potentially do and the way that it interacts with a very complex system, which is an older individual with dementia, with multiple medical problems, already on multiple other medications. So other practical tips involve um, really being organized, keeping uh, as much as you can, um, keeping track of medications and the content of physician visits uh, with a caregiver handbook. So um, there's, this, uh, there's a great um, link here and a website that's listed in my references um, for caregivers that can really be helpful. Um, this particular uh, document is a, uh, essentially a PDF um, that helps sort of keep track of the medications um, and when they've been increased or decreased. Because a lot of times, too, um, there may be multiple different providers um, sort of increasing medication, taking off medication, adding medication, and it's important to sort of have a place to consolidate that, med that uh, information, particularly if the individual is not being treated within one healthcare system. Um, so if suspicion is high for a potential um, medication-related problem, it, it's very easy to just go to um, a drug interaction checker. Um, and so I also listed a link for that at the bottom of this slide. Um, simply type in the names of the medications and the, um, the uh, drug interaction checker will give you a list of the medications that may or may not be a problem. Um, so here are my references. I would uh, like to draw your attention to the Family and Caregiver Alliance uh, website, which is a really excellent resource to use. Um, and again, I'd like to remind you to please feel free to ask questions via Twitter uh, using the hashtag UCLAMDChat. And so um, we'll go ahead and take questions at this time. Okay, so we've got a couple questions here. Um, okay. All right, so I'll start off with, um, can certain medications make my dementia worse? Um, and uh, so this is a really um, excellent question. Um, and frequently, a patient will be started on um, a medication and feel as though their dementia is getting worse, or their cognitive impairment is getting worse. Um, now, uh, I would argue there, there isn't any medication that necessarily um, makes dementia worse, as in accelerates the course of dementia or worsens the dementia, um, causing kind of a steep decline, for example. However, there are medications that can cause cognitive impairment. So even in somebody who is, for example, um, you know, 50 years old without any uh, cognitive impairment or dementia, if they take certain medications, they will feel as though they're not remembering things well um, and they're cognitively impaired. And when you discontinue that medication, they go back to their baseline. So um, to answer your question, there aren't necessarily any medications that will accelerate the course of dementia or make dementia worse, but there are medications that cause cognitive impairment. And the key word with those are any medications that have anticholinergic effects. So things like Benadryl, um, any of the uh, benzodiazepines can make cognition worse based on the way they're sort of um, working or acting. Um, you know, any of the benzodiazepine like sedative hypnotics. Um, a, a lot of times, uh, some patients can experience cognitive dulling on medications that are frequently used um, for neurological conditions. Uh, so, for example, um, some patients may have cognitive dulling on a medication like Topamax. Um, so, uh, I would say that absolutely there are medications that can make it feel like. Um, your thought processes are worsening or not, uh, are, are getting worse. 
Um, but I would uh, say that once you discontinue those medications, um, you typically see uh, an improvement. Um, there recently was an article that uh, implicated uh, benzodiazepines um, as uh, being more associated with developing dementia. Um, that uh, article obviously requires further research. Um, however, it was unclear whether um, the benzodiazepines were being used more in people who had sort of the pre-morbid signs of dementia. So uh, sort of a pro, sorry, the pro, uh, prodrome of dementia, and they happen to be more medicated with those medications to treat the prodrome or the, um, the signs, uh, the behavioral and mood issues that come before dementia uh, versus the medication actually causing dementia. So um, it's important to keep uh, that in mind. Um, so I'm looking here. Uh, my dad recently um, lost more weight. Uh, are mental issues from PTSD a cause of quote unquote wasting away and steady physical decline? Um, this is a, a great question. I you know I think it would be tough to really say for sure in the individual uh, situation. Um, obviously, I haven't uh, interviewed your father um, or worked with him, but um, absolutely untreated um, other other mental health conditions that are not adequately treated can certainly lead to social withdrawal, loss of appetite, depression. Depression in itself can cause a wasting away if it is untreated. Um, so frequently we call these the neurovegetative signs of depression. Patients don't want to eat, um, they're, you know, they're not sleeping terribly well or they're sleeping all the time. Um, they're kind of uh, refusing to kind of interact, sort of um, deconditioning. So it's very important to um, obtain a consultation with a geriatric psychiatrist where you can effectively tease out how much is the untreated PTSD, for example, leading to um, depression or withdrawal um, or you know, um, disengagement or loss of appetite. Um, how much is that contributing uh, versus the um, dementia, which in itself, um, in the end stages, can uh, lead to that. So I think it would be very um, key to sort of parse that out, um, especially you know, with, with your father's situation. Um, let's see. So um, are there medications that can prevent dementia? This is an excellent question. Um, so it's a, it's a very multifaceted question in the sense that the overall answer is, as of now, we do not have any medications that have been proven to prevent uh, dementia. There's also, um, it's important to consider, though, that there are many different types of dementia. So there's dementia associated with Alzheimer's disease. There's dementia associated with vascular um, dementia. So for example, vascular changes in the brain um, lead to a dementia. So similar to um, the way that plaques in the vessels of the heart can cause heart disease, plaques in the vessels of the brain can cause inflammation um, and uh, cause a, a dementia that we call a vascular dementia. There's um, park, uh, dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, um, et cetera. Um, so in terms of medications that prevent dementia, we don't have something across the board that can really prevent it. However, we do know that physical activity, um, good diet, um, um, some have argued that uh, mental, kind of mental stimulation and novelty can be very helpful um, in sort of, uh, you know, working with uh, patients not converting into dementia when they have cognitive decline. Um, however, um, it would be also important, for example, in somebody who has vascular risk factors like um, high blood pressure or uh, high cholesterol or diabetes, if keeping those things under control with medications um, can actually, with medications and lifestyle, I should say, can actually improve kind of the course, especially if vascular dementia um, is, is what we're talking about here. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, 
as of now, there, there are some promising, I think, vitamin E. Recently, there was a study that came out about patients who already have dementia, vitamin E improving sort of the decline. There was a recent study that just came out this month about Celexa, the antidepressant, being helpful in preventing decline. But in terms of preventing onset, um, unfortunately, we uh, do not have anything at this point that can do that. Um, unfortunately, in this field, our diagnostics, our ability to diagnose an image and look at what's going on in the pathology are far ahead um, than our ability to really um, necessarily treat the, the condition. So um, our ability to diagnose it, our ability to look at prognosis, much better than where we are in terms of medications to treat it. And I hope that that changes in the future. Um, Let's see, uh, so I think we talked about uh, can medications cause mental decline um, or dementia? Um, how long does it take uh, for a medication for dementia to work? Um, so this is, uh, this is certainly challenging because there really haven't been um, studies that uh, kind of quantify exactly, you know, um, when the medications start to work or don't start to work. But I would say within, I would say within a two, one to two month period of starting the medication, uh, these medications do take time to titrate up to the appropriate dose. So it's a sort of a slow, um, you know, titration that occurs. But, um, you know, I think that it really depends. I've had patients say, you know, within a couple weeks, they, they sense kind of a difference in their loved one, um, just in terms of energy and engagement and interest, um, and sometimes improvements in behavior. Um, I have not had any patients who really, when we're talking about the, the improvement cognitively for the cognitive symptoms, it's not a dramatic um, improvement at all. If anything, it's essentially working to just keep the person where they're at for a longer period of time. So um, you would expect it to work within about a month or two of being on it, but the idea is that the medicine is keeping the person where they're at for a longer period of time rather than um, the decline that uh, in inevitably will occur um, occurring sooner. So uh, that's essentially you know, the idea about how the medication works. And I think it, it leads to challenges because a lot of family members often are left wondering, well, is the medication actually working or not? And there will be maybe some subtle changes that they see, but um, for the most part, it's a question of uh, to know whether the medication's actually working is to look at another reality where the person was not on the medicine and how far they declined um, or how quickly they declined uh, in that sort of situation compared to being on the medicine. So it's very challenging. We do know, though, that there are situations where the patients come off medications for a few weeks, and they really, um, caregivers may notice a, a steeper decline at that point. So that's where it's important to really follow up with the physician. Um, if the decision is made to stop the medications, if it's felt that they're not doing anything, and really monitor the patient closely. Um, so I think that's the questions that we have for today. Um, I'm happy to take other questions that have come in or. Okay. Thank you so much for letting me participate in this webinar today. Um, feel free to uh, contact me um, through my information on the website. Um, and uh, the video of this presentation is also available on YouTube. Um, and uh, can be watched um, there as well. Thank you very much.